today, he unveiled a climate change plan of historic significance and a plan which I am sure he's going to outline for you um, briefly. His pedigree is as an environmentally active politician. He is well known as that. He also has a reputation as a bona fide Canadian nationalist, as an academic, as a successful politician, and of course as a triumphant leader. And the fact he is here today to talk to you in an open forum, to answer all questions honestly and straight up, I think speaks volumes about the kind of leader that he is. He listens and then he acts. And I know that from my personal experience that this guy cherishes debate and discussion and then he has the courage to act after he's had the respect to listen to all voices. So it is an honor to present to you the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Federal Liberal Party of Canada, my colleague, the Honorable Stefan Leon. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me uh, to be with you in indeed the fastest growing city in Canada. In fact, uh, Milton was 13,000 people in 2001 and 54,000 people in 2006. And the projection in 20 years, 125,000 people. Well, I don't know what is the explanation, but I guess part of the explanation, the explanation is because we have a so much attractive mayor and member of parliament. <laughs> Uh, about guard, the third thing I may say, I never saw a colleague, and I'm sure Bonnie will agree, a colleague who in some weeks became so much respected by his new colleagues than what guard is for the Liberal Caucus now. Uh, how many colleagues are telling me, I want to know what guard thinks about that, thinks about this. <laughs> so you're accustomed to that, but for us it's new. And uh, it's so, um, he's really a great help. He has a good view. A strong views about many, many issues, and one of them is the environment. <laughs> what we are facing about the environment is a Milton uh, at the level of the planet. We are uh, six billion human beings now. Last century, at the same date, we were 1.5 billion human beings. In addition to it, most of the human beings at that time didn't have an industrialization part of their life. Now, among the six billion, four billion in the, are in the industrialized world. The other two billions are not living in a sustainable world at all, since they need energy, they are cutting trees, burning woods, at a rate we cannot imagine, creating desertification everywhere. The ones that enjoy our way of life, well, let's say that all of these six, human, six billion human beings would have the uh, standard of living of a Canadian and the level of consumption of an average Canadian, you would need five planets to make five planets to make it to make it sustainable. Um, we have 600 cars by 1,000 inhabitants in Canada. Uh, well, they have uh, 10 cars by 1,000 inhabitants in per 1,000 inhabitants in China, except that every year. Ch the Chinese people are buying more cars than all the cars you have in circulation in Canada. And they are 1.2 billion of human beings. So you imagine in which world we will be. Uh, we will be 9 billion human beings in 2050. It's going pretty fast. And it's very clear that it's not sustainable. The main sign that we are in trouble is climate change. And uh, according to the Stern report, the former, uh, former chief economist of the World Bank, uh, if we do nothing, in a couple of decades, humanity will, will have lost a third, a fifth, excuse me, a fifth of its wealth. So we'll have, we'll be, we'll have a fifth less to share for nine billion human beings instead of six. It will be a tremendous, a terrible, a terrible mess. Unless we act. And if we act, we may change a pain and a gain. Because when humanity starts to think about the problem and find solutions, we are very good. And we may find solutions that we cannot imagine today that will make our world sustainable. I think one of the conditions to succeed is that some countries will take the lead. 
I want Canada to be one of them. The plan I released this morning will be a major step for that. This plan is to find a way to be sure that the big industry in Canada will decrease in its greenhouse gas emissions in a way that will push this industry to invest billions and billions of dollars every year in uh, environmental technology solutions, good industrial processors, and so on. And the result is that in 2012, the last year of the first phase of Kyoto, uh, we will be able to reach our target, but above all, will be the momentum to have energy efficiency, green technologies, will be a super, po a super power of green technologies in the world. How the plan will work? Very simple. You give a carbon budget to the nation. The Canadian nation has a carbon budget. It is our Kyoto target. That means that our emissions of greenhouse gases that are creating climate change, these emissions must go below 6% starting 1990. The emissions we had in 1990, minus 6%. This is our target. The industry has the same target in Canada. So you ask to each one of these facilities, the 700 facilities that are responsible for 50% of our emissions, to keep their emissions within their carbon budget, their Kyoto target. They will say to, to you, I cannot. I will have extra emissions many tons of CO2, of carbon, of greenhouse gases, over my target. We'll say, okay, you pay $20 a ton every year. Uh, this ton is not a tax. It doesn't go in the pocket of the government. It stays in an account. And this account, you have access to it if you come with projects to decrease your emissions. You pay, the money is an account, and you have your money back when the emissions are, are cut. And if you don't do that, we'll keep the money and we will in, invest in green technologies in the province where the facility is. So the money will not go in the coffers in Ottawa. It will stay where it is. So Albertans, for instance, cannot complain. It's not a way to grab the money and to put that out of Alberta. It's a way to be sure that the money will stay in Alberta longer to do the right thing for Albertans. So this is the plan. It's very innovative. The env environmental groups, Suzuki, Pembena, and so on, are very pleased by it. It's what we need to do. The only thing that is lacking is that this is not the plan of the government. It's the plan of the official opposition. And the official opposition is saying to the government, do it. It would be good for Canada. If you, do, if you want to change the name and to pretend it's coming from you, Mr. Harper, we are accustomed to that. But do it. Climate change is only part of the problem we have. We need to have clean water. We need to have clean air. We need to save our, our, uh, our ecosystems, our forests, our lakes. Uh, we need to have a, a lively... Uh, uh, way to live in our big cities. Uh, we need to know what to do with the waste to change in, shit in recycling. Climate change being the worst ecological threat. When you do your job for climate change, it gives you a strong motivation to do it for clean water, clean air, and so on. Now, I want to hear from you. I want to know what you would like uh, we, the Liberal Party, uh, may put in our platform for the next election. I don't want an election. But if there is one, I want to win it for my country. And I will need your help for that. And I will need the help of Bunny and Gart and everyone. And now the best way to, to learn how to help you is to work with you, to have a very good dialogue with all of you. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. All right, Mr. Mr. Dion, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be Dr. Phil now, so we're going to go around the room. Um, we are going to take questions from the room. We have, uh, we have a large online audience right now, so we have questions coming in also from across Canada. So from time to time, I'll go to one or two of those. We also have a couple of people here that we've asked specifically to come and have their voices heard. And uh, one of those is, uh, is Liz Brennan. And Liz, you're with Oakville Green. And Liz, you've got a, a question or a statement, please, from Mr. Dion. Here you go. 
So fossil fuels are finite, and experts say that we've taken about half of all the available supply. There will be increasingly less conventional energy in the future, and it will be much more costly. Mr. Dion, what will your government do to reduce this country's dependence on fossil fuels and promote alternative, sustainable energy sources? Thank you. Well, part of their answer is in this document, balancing our carbon budget. The industry 700 companies or facilities are responsible for half of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And they, they do it what? In, in which way? By combustion, in, in burning a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, we are telling to them, find, find a solution to decrease your emissions. And they will. And solutions exist. Yesterday, uh, a gentleman recognized me and came with a business card. And he claims that in the coming years, we'll have for mass consumption buses and cars uh, only with electricity. I, I know that this will not become true unless we create a market for it. And the market is created in giving a price to the carbon. So at $30 a ton, it's now more interesting to look at for clean electricity instead of carbon. And you're right, we need to act, because anyway, what will tear the pump, if it remains gasoline, will go up and up and up. Because uh, the, the, the supply uh, cannot follow the demand. Uh, the demand is booming, and more and more we need to go deep in the sea or in the oil or the, of the oil sands to, feed, to, to find additional sources of oil. It's the world with which we are. And natural gas is the same problem. We need to have renewable sources of energy, and for that, Canada must be a leading country. All right, thank you. Uh, let me just go. We have a question here. I'm unfortunate, Mr. Dion. I think it's from um, a Tory in Alberta. Um, <laughs> Mr. Dion, how do you see the current policy you've announced today being different from previous liberal policies? Why didn't you propose such a measure when you were Minister of the Environment? Uh, two questions. I guess I will start with the second one. First, I was not the leader, the easy answer. But uh, the, 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 other, uh, the other answer is, if it's the only cri crit criticism that will, I will receive, why you didn't do it in 2005? I'm ready to take the, the, the criticism. We always improve our views. Uh, I have better ideas now than two years ago. I'm taking. To, I'm ready to uh, apologize. I will not apologize for that. That I, I have better idea today than today two years ago. In the last months, I received countless of business cards of experts from Canada and elsewhere, help, telling me there is other ways to design the solution to have greenhouse gas emissions going down and profits going up. And it came with this plan. I wish I would have invented it three or four years ago. I come with it today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dion, John, Johnny Opstein is, uh, who are you with today representing, John? Alton Federation of Agriculture. Alton Federation. Local right. farmers. Local farmers, okay. Yeah, so can I add on the other part of his question, this gentleman, uh, the Albertan gentleman? Ah, yes. It go it's good for Alberta, what I'm proposing. Alberta has no sustainable future as it is now to extract the uh, raw material and to sell it to United States or to other foreign countries with only some royalties paid to the province. It's not a future. The best future is to ask the money to stay longer in Alberta, to have transformative capacity, to have sustainable development, not only to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, but acid drain and all the polluter, pollutants and to use, to use the skills that we have in Alberta and Saskatchewan elsewhere to have the rich jobs that will come with it. And it's what I'm proposing. I'm, I'm the best partner for Alberta. The Quebecer is much better than the Albertan on this issue. <laughs> all right, John, what's your question or comment? Uh, Mr. John, first of all, welcome to Halton. My Thank home. you. Uh, governments have many tools in their toolbox when it comes to affecting change on any issue, uh, including climate change uh, in the environment. An example for this is I have this pair of blocking pliers. And farmers, uh, ask any farmers, this is a good multi-use tool, but it has some serious drawbacks. It can, uh, you know, it could, when you're trying to fix the thing you're fixing, it can round off bolts and cause all kinds of problems. But you have, on the other hand, I have my three-quarter inch wrench, uh, which is a great specific tool and there's no risk of damage to, to the thing you're trying to fix if you use it properly. In past governments, uh, past governments have used strong legislation 
uh, with a little bit of money to help uh, pay for some of the small percentage of the capital investment for farmers. And that is kind of like the locking pliers. It's a good tool, but probably not the right one for the job. But I look at the wrench as a pay for the environment, uh, pay for the environmental services that farmers provide, and education and promotion of the public to buy local food. And it's done in other areas such as uh, such as Europe. There's a lot of programs like that. Personally, I believe, and I apologize for this analogy, but to kill two birds with one stone, but in helping, it can help the environment and solve the farm income crisis. Which do you believe is the best tool? Between these two? Between <laughs> between between strong legislation and paying farmers for their environmental good. Ah. Uh, I think you need to have a set of tools. You cannot choose only one tool. You cannot only have taxes. You cannot only have the regulations. You cannot only have incentives. And, and uh, for uh, Canadian agriculture, uh, I strongly believe that the, the Kyoto plan would be a great help. Uh, because if we do what I'm suggesting, a climate fund, climate fund would, would be a kind of environmental bank that will reward the good behaviors everywhere. Uh, and then the Im imaginative capacity of our farmers will be rewarded. The ones that are doing nothing will have nothing, and the, war the ones that are doing their best to protect the environment and decrease their emissions and so on will receive a help from the climate fund. Okay. All right, any other questions? And there are please? so many things we may do, uh, like to change value in electricity, for instance. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alan Elger. I'm a councillor in Oakville and Halton Region. My question to you today, Mr. Dion, is what your government will do to affect a change in our forest cover in urban areas? Because the federal government has said we need a 30% forest cover to protect the air quality. And in southern Ontario, we all live in a stressed air shed right now. And in fact, the woodlots keep coming down. And there is no tool that I'm aware of other than your federal government says we have to have 30 percent. But everything then goes to the province uh, that they're supposed to do something, but they don't. And a developer comes in, and we, there is no bylaw in place that will stay in place once the developer comes in with a development application and is going to cut down a complete woodlot. And they've just finished uh, an airshed study in Oakville and Clarkson where in fact we are not now meeting the minimum provincial requirements based on particulate matter PM 2.5 and in fact growth keeps happening. What are we going to do and what are you going to do in your new government to resolve this issue going forward? I'm sure that if you go from 13,000 to 50,000 and what I said 120,000 in the coming decade, um, the green cover is is not as it was. It's very difficult for a mayor to avoid that. If you have more people, we have less green cover. But I agree with you that we need to be very careful. There are two things I think we should do. The first one is what the Prime Minister announced two days ago, uh, to have a, a foundation helping for the private money to go to protect the, uh, the uh, ecological areas as much as possible. This idea was in my platform. The Prime Minister uh, took it almost word by word, so I will not say it's a bad idea. Uh, the uh, the uh, other thing that uh, we need to do is to have a systematic offset system in Canada. It's what they are starting to to do, to do in UK. That it, that means that everybody has a footprint of the number of emissions we are supposed to send every year. A bit like our one-ton challenge, but it must be very very clear. And each time you have an event like or like a like a conference or, or whatever it must be offset for the number of emissions they are sending in the atmosphere by something they invest that will help to compensate and most of the time is this to have more trees and then you increase a lot the number of trees uh, that uh, will have to plant in Canada for instance I made a commitment today that our electoral campaign whenever it will be our electoral campaign, the Liberal Party, will be um, carbon neutral. We'll invest to compensate, and many times it will be to invest to have more trees in Canada. We don't give as many speeches then either, do we? <laughs> okay. All right. We'll, we'll sort of wind our way around here. You're next. I'm Elke Luzanola. I live in Oakville. My question, that's not a question. I would like to see 
the federal government um, enact legislation that would very severely restrict the sale of water from Canada to any other country. I fully with you. As a prime minister, I will I may tell you that if with the help of Canadians I become prime minister, there will never be any bulk water renewal in Canada. Thank you and uh, welcome to Halton. I'm a resident of Milton. My name is Victor Santa Cruz. I'm also the executive director of the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association. One of the big issues, I think, with the environment is carbon footprint, more than anything, is the yeah. amount of carbon that individuals produce. I think environmentalism in general uh, has to start with the home, with the individual. Now, we can talk about all these plans, but we have to take responsibility as uh, human beings living in this, in this planet. And from our industry, we are environmental horticulturalists. We believe in sustainable horticulture, which means environmental sustainability. And specifically with that is that the benefits of green spaces, and that's trees, lawns, parks, they have an environmental benefit for all of Canada. And specifically, trees and green spaces reduce heating, which reduce our carbon footprint, improve water, which again is a big issue also in the Halton region. And it also beautifies the space. It produces lifestyle benefits, environmental benefits, economic benefits. And you know, we are the only sector in horticulture that gets tax GST. We are 2.2 billion. And uh, you have $132 million in GST taxes from our industry alone. And if you really want to make uh, a benefit to the environment, say, buy a tree, buy green goods, and that GST money we'll use for environmental benefit. We'll use that for environmental sustainability, perhaps technology, perhaps more green spaces and parks. And we're talking about Milton, how it's exploded recently. And I bought a new home, so I can talk firsthand here in Milton. I got uh, three seedlings, because I have a big lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things that we can do is create legislation, especially in Milton, so I'm speaking specifically as a resident here, ensure that you have mature trees. Don't cut down all these green spaces. Ensure that you have green trees. What, what's your question for Mr. Diano? Not locally, but is it the GST? Well, GST is one of them, but what will you do to work with sustainable horticulture, sustainable environmentalism, and also uh, another statement too is I congratulate you as a leader, because I know that's been questioned lately, and I thank you because you've done three things. You've taken Garth Turner in, so it shows that you believe in consultation, we believe in cooperation, and I think we have to work together. You can speak as long as you'd like now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will take from your question, especially the emphasis you put on environmental tax reform. I think it has been a mistake for our country to decrease the GST by one point. It would certainly be a terrible mistake to do it again. Why? Because there is no transformative capacity in it. It's 5.5 billion that we that we don't have, uh, I would have preferred uh, income, income tax to be cut instead of uh, to see an increase of the income tax, and also to have uh, tax cuts where it will help you to create your own tax cuts over the years. The best way is to help you to retrofit your house. And then your tax bill, your, 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 bill, your electricity bill, excuse me, uh, will be less costly over the years. So I would invest a lot in tax reform to help you to retrofit your house, to choose the good appliances, uh, the, the best cars. I have heard that it's likely that the Prime Minister will come at the next budget with a rebate uh, for the, for the le most efficient cars. I encourage him to do that. It would be a good step. These are the kind of tax cuts that we need to do in Canada that will help the people to make the link between the planet and their wallet. Thank you. Uh, question here. Hi, my name is Andrea Grabenz and I'm from North Burlington. And I'm sure you're aware that uh, between 1996 and 2004, California, in California, they had zero emission electric vehicles. Uh, and they were made by GM, Ford, Toyota, and Honda. And uh, in addition to your climate fund, uh, when you are Prime Minister, will you introduce legislation to force the auto industry to produce and sell these zero emission vehicles? And will you also help with incentives for the regular person to purchase these vehicles? The answer to all your questions is yes, big time. <laughs> all right, very good. Thank you. Over here, sir. 
Okay, my name is uh, Robert Bator, and I'm representing the Niagara North Federation of Agriculture. And when you talk about uh, carbon sequestration, like uh, down in Niagara, our farms are quite small, uh, and so we produce, uh, on average, maybe 100, 200 ton of produce. But uh, that, about half of that is carbon that's uh, taken from the air and is sequestered in our plants. And in our plants themselves, there's probably at least four times as much organic matter, uh, which is mostly carbon. And uh, I don't hear about any uh, recognition given to the amount of carbon that farmers are sequestering. Uh, one acre of uh, corn uh, sequesters more carbon than some of these uh, green spaces here with shortcut uh, fescue grass. So uh, why isn't there some recognition, uh, some credit given to uh, farmers for sequestering all this? Uh, I can't see any difference uh, between uh, the trees that we have in our orchards and trees in the forest. The, the, per acre, there's uh, uh, exactly uh, the same amount of uh, uh, photosynthesis uh, sequestering the carbon dioxide. So why, why uh, you know, look for forests when farmlands are doing the job? The answer is because Mr. Harper burned my climate change plan. In, in the uh, Project Green, the plan we had, indeed we were rewarding low-till practices and everything that uh, the agriculture in Canada may do to, say, to have better sequestration of the carbon. It's part of the plan. Uh, low-till practices, uh, are, are the, as I said, the, for, for the capacity to change manure in electricity in a systematic way, all these kind of solutions would be boosted by a good climate change plan, and the agriculture, the farmers of Canada, would be strong partners for it. Uh, do you want to? Can you lean in here? Let's uh, tell me what your marital problem is. <laughs> okay, environmentalist. Counseling. Uh, my name is Kathy Hansen. I'm a guest here today from Wellington County. I'm an organic farmer, and uh, I think it's a good time of year for the farmers to get out and voice their opinion. I'm glad to see so many here today. Uh, my question is, uh, for Mr. Dion, is that you spoke about the, uh, the 6 billion human beings on the planet and the forecast for 9 billion by 2050. And we know, we've we know that right now we are producing enough calories on the planet to feed the people on the planet. But at the rate of loss of agricultural land worldwide and particularly in parts of Canada like where we are standing here today, we may not be able to feed ourselves. It's nothing to be proud of, the fact that we are good citizens. We need to think ahead, think about food security and think about where the farmers fit into that equation. The previous speaker mentioned, what about carbon sequestration? Is there any plan, or would you think in the future, about farmers being part of this offsetting fund that you're talking about? How could individual family farms tap into that as opposed to the monies going to perhaps larger uh, operations that wouldn't have the capacity for the carbon sequestration that we have. Yes, exactly. The offset system, for those of us who understand what that means, it's, it's um, when a company cannot reach its target, um, if the company is doing the right thing, for instance, helping farmers for, for the new technology that exists to have more green coverage or, as I said, to change value and electricity and so on, or to have wind power, to have uh, sources of energy that are cleaner, not in the production as such as, uh, as, as the industry, but outside, we call it offset. And they offset them their production in doing so. And we will create an offset system in Canada that will be beneficial for the mayors, for the farmers, uh, for the SMEs, small industrial enterprises, uh, and it's why I want to create this climate fund that will help the offset to work. And you need a kind of environmental bank that is rewarding the greenhouse gas reductions in every corner of the society and that is giving a lot of venture capital to the inventors that have difficulties today to receive any help from the private banking system because they look a bit uh, 
it's a bit of risk because their technologies are unknown. They are good but unknown. So the government must be there to back, and it's what I would like to do to my climate fund, in which we are ready to invest a lot of, uh, of money. It will be well-invested money. It will help us to reach our Kyoto target. It will help our agriculture, our municipalities, our medium-sized enterprises, and, and so on. All right, thank you very much, sir, over here. Hi, welcome to uh, Alton Hills, Mr. Dion. My name is LJ Schertzel, and I'm, I'm a youth. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, there's a lot, from what I can understand, there's a lot of work still to be done on the Kyoto Protocol. Now, if we were to meet the demands for the Kyoto Protocol, what kind of an, what kind of an impact could we see on the economy? I think it will, it fits well done, and it's what we're proposing here. It will be good for the economy. If you look around the world, the um, productivity growth in Canada is not very, very impressive. Uh, if you compare with other countries, what Japan, Sweden, and other countries did better than us, they link the economy and the environment together. And when you do that in the proper way, well, indeed your industry will come with better industrial practices, uh, better environmental technologies, and they will save money because one of the ways to be profitable today is to decrease your energy cost. And when you decrease your energy cost, it's very likely that you will decrease your pollution and your greenhouse gas emissions. It's what we are proposing to do, to link the environment and the economy together. If I may give two examples, when after the disaster of the pine beetle, uh, British Columbians decided to reinvest in their um, in their tools, in their, tech, uh, in their instruments to, uh, for forest, forest um, tools. They went in Scandinavia because there they had strong regulations to put in the obligation the companies to select the trees they want to cut. And they are much more efficient than uh, instruments to do the job than in Canada. So we are importing everything instead of selling to others our know-how. We have been too slow to link the sustainability of our forest with the, with the industry, the forest industry. We should do that, and we should have done that, and we need to do that. The other example is very good for, our, for Ontario, is the car industry. In, uh, a, a decade ago, the Japanese realized that their economy was flat. They, figure out what to do to come back with a vengeance in the market. And they, f they decided to come with regulations of the government to impose to the industry more energy efficiency. And now they car their cars are, s are sold everywhere in North America, and we are losing jobs. We should have done that long time ago. And I will suggest certainly, as a, a, a lady mentioned just before, that we need, indeed, to to build more efficient cars in Canada in order to save our jobs. It's a link between the environment and the economy that we need to see big time because if you have a better solution to be sure that we'll be the most competitive country in the world, tell me. My solution, my industrial strategy is to tackle the sustainable economy now before it's too late. Thank you. All right, Eric, what's your question? I'm Eric Trogdon from the uh, Ontario Parks Association, and we believe in partnerships, and we have developed strong partnerships, and some were handed to me today that would answer the question of what you're trying to do. We find an issue where we need the infrastructure money which the government wants to give our government, but they're not agreeing on it. What can we do to help you with your government to get our Ontario government to give us that infrastructure money and not to throw it into the roads but into our parks and open spaces. How can we help? You are saying that your provincial government is keeping the infrastructure money? and open space is that important. That's what we have been told. If I'm wrong, they need to tell me differently. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we have done is through the transfer of the gas tax, we have insisted that all the money should go for sustainable infrastructure. Uh, it's the, it would be $2 billion a year, but it will be which year? Will Pretty soon. $2 billion of transfer of the gas tax from the federal government to municipalities in Canada 
we propose to make it permanent, not to let that sunset after five years that it's supposed to be, to make it permanent. So it will be $2 billion every year for sustainable infrastructure in Canada, and I'm sure that I will sit with the Premier of Ontario uh, and we'll f figure out how we may be sure that a lot of this money will go for for the national the, the parks that you have in Ontario. I'm sure you will be very willing to work with me about that and with your mayors. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I thought you, you have a very good Premier, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> now, uh, what are you doing? I'm blogging. <laughs> You're, blog you're blogging. You're, you're, you're blogging live. What do you think of this, Mr. Leader? Uh, we, have, we have a blogger here. I don't know if you really want me to be, to be the, the resident blogger concerning my blog. All right, well, tell people where, where you're blogging. You're blogging to your web website, right? Which is? The, the Wing Nutterer. The Wing Nutterer. Uh, we're supposed to take this seriously, are we? Well, I'm the reliable news source for unreliable news. <laughs> All right. Question. Thank you, Garth. Uh, my name is Skid Crease. I'm a, a guest from Dufferin Caledon. And uh, our youth voice over here just reminded me of something I wanted to ask you. In 2005, we sent some students to see you at the uh, summit, COP11 in Montreal, uh, from Students on Ice. And uh, Alicia Garmelitz uh, helped... Uh, make her youth declaration to you. You were there white knight in, uh, in green armor uh, for the children who were there. Uh, you, in fact, included their youth declaration, I believe, in the international agreement. Um, since that point in time, um, I'd like you to, uh, to be able to tell me what has happened to that youth voice since our new government uh, has taken charge, and how will you, as our next prime minister, please renew Canada's reputation on the international stage for living up to its international agreements? In December 2005, the United Nations brought the world in Montreal to save the Kyoto Protocol that was in danger to collapse, to implement it, and to convince the non-Kyoto countries to work with the others under the Convention of Climate Change of the United Nations. It was in Montreal. Canada was chairing the conference. I was the president, the chair. And at the beginning, everybody was were, were saying it will collapse, the world is too divided. It was a blame game. Why I would do any sacrifice? It's your fault. Oh no, it's, I, I'm doing enough. It's for you, and so on. It was, it was the move. During one year, we traveled everywhere in the world. I went twice in China. I went five, six times in the United States. And we worked very hard. And Mr. Layton came at the beginning of the conference. And the election began at that time. We were in an election, December 2005. Mr. Layton said this conference will collapse uh, because Canada has no credibility whatsoever. And he left. Fortunately, that nobody knew who was Jack Layton. <laughs> because uh, he, because uh, we worked very hard. And at the end of the day, with the help of the youth, by the way, they were very, very helpful. At the end of, uh, of the day, when I bang, we had an agreement. It was the Montreal Action Plan for Climate Change. A great moment, a great success for Canadian diplomacy. What happened after is an election, and we lost. And the Conservatives came, they killed the plan, the Montreal plan, they killed our climate change plan, they sent Madame Ambrose everywhere uh, to be sure that no target would be imposed to Canada. And tomorrow it's for Mr. Baird to go there, and he will say roughly the same. Canada, according to the Sierra Club in their last uh, Kyoto uh, card, the Sierra Club, the environmental groups, that, that Canada came from hero to zero. I cannot accept it. I want Canada to go from zero to hero. Help me for that. Sir. My name is Paul Tate. I live here in Milton. And uh, the one thought that I had for day to, to say to the next Prime Minister of Canada about the uh, ecosystem around here is about construction. Uh, we have infrastructure and we build roads with flexible paving called asphalt. We've been doing it for years and asphalt of course comes from fossil fuels. When it's on the surface it runs off and uh, it causes pollution from that. The fact of the matter is we can build roads out of concrete as the wearing surface and use half the ballast which means half the aggregate. So if we built out of concrete instead of asphalt we wouldn't have to rape 
uh, this area over here of aggregate. So what I'm suggesting is that at a federal level, we could uh, lead an initiative that says as you do infrastructure and you fund infrastructure, you do it not using bitumens as a wearing surface, but using concrete, and then you can recycle it. Simple as that, and you'll save money. That's it. Very good idea. Give me your, give me your business card. Uh, let's move up here. We'll kind of work our way back through the room once more. Yes. I'm Mickey McGuire, and I'm from Wellington. Um, I would like to know if there's a process in your plan that might allow people like myself who are joining, for example, next week, 50 or 60 of us are getting together to see if we can, as a group, uh, put uh, sun, um, sun uh, collectors onto our roots uh, so that it can be collected to the grid and in that way uh, absorb clean energy and then electricity is a clean form of energy. So we, I just wonder if like for people like us, and it would also benefit say farmers who converge in the country together that they could put up windmills in their in mutual corners. It would be the same kind of a plan, right? So, yes. would there be a process in your plan that would help us? I'm just, I'm just thinking that one of those solar planks is around thirty-five thousand dollars, and I'm going to have to mortgage my home to do it. Yes, uh, absolutely. By different ways, we may speed up the use of renewable energy uh, by individuals, by companies everywhere in Canada. We need an environmental tax reform. We need the offset system. We need to regulate the big industry put the biggest obligation to use these technologies. We need to give uh, uh, help for the renewable energy, like wind, solar, um, and so on, to be sure that they will be able to be more competitive in the market. And it's why we need a climate change plan. But we don't have one today. We had one in 2005. Mr. Harper killed it and changed it by nothing. And in the last months, he had made a lot of announcements about programs that he cut and he reinvented in changing the name. But this doesn't give to Canada a plan in a direction. And my concern is that I think he's doing it, not because he has seen the light and he believes in, in, in the cause. In last December, when he said to you, Happy Merry Christmas, in, in his uh, interviews of the, the end of the year, he spoke about the so-called greenhouse gases. He was an adult when he said that. He was believing in what he was saying. What I think is today is looking at the polls, and he, he sees that he has a problem with his image. So not only is he trying to destroy my image with the negative ads, but he's trying to build an image for himself, two billions of dollars that he's pouring here and there. But it's not a comprehensive plan. It's what I'm committed to offer to the Canadian people at the next election. We're not, we're not done yet. A few more minutes. I have a question here that's come online. Uh, Mr. Dion, how will we solve our energy addiction and transition to a hydrogen economy without nuclear power? Okay. I'm not sure it will be hydrogen, but hydrogen, hydrogen must have the capacity to compete with the other source of, of energy. Maybe we will not need hydrogen. If we have the, the idea that it's possible to have um, um, the fuel in a zinc, the evening, you you branch um, you, you you plug. Excuse me, you plug. Thank you. You plug your, your car during the night. In the morning, when you wake up, you you may use it yeah, all the day long, and with no emission. If it's true that this technology makes sense, you don't need hydrogen anymore. But maybe not. It's, I think it's not for the government to decide what will work. The government must create the playing field to be sure that everyone will, will compete on the same footing. And it's what I will do. It's the best way. You create a market. You, you wake up all the innovative capacity you have in this country. For that, I need my plan. I need that. I need my climate fund. I need my carbon market. I need that. And then you will have to play. And I'm sure that we Canadians, once we have a plan, we will be a great nation for the world. Question. Sure. Yeah, I'm Mike Davis. I'm from Halton Hills, uh, just north of here in Georgetown. Um, and I'm pretty proud sometimes when I can. I, uh, I jump on my bike and do my errands as opposed to jumping in my car and going to the bank and that sort of thing. 
Uh, my question is um, uh, about public transit. Um, in Halton Hills, it's a very political issue, um, a local political issue, where the um, you sort of think of public transit more as going to be bad development, going to be bringing in sort of um, less class people into the community by having public transit, so they've taken that out. But I, I believe that from the environment point of view that we should really be promoting public transit as much as we can. I know the provincial and federal governments uh, do kick in money for that. And I'm just wondering for, for trying to turn around the, the, the local population in Georgetown, how you could sort of spin that whole public transit to keep it out of bringing in uh, undesirable people and more for the environment and more for keeping cars off the road, things like that. You, uh, you have all, a lot of homeless people on transit in Georgetown, do you? <laughs> all right. Part, part of the answer is uh, the $2 billion I, I mentioned coming from the transfer of the gas tax for sustainable infrastructure and urban transit. Another part of the answer is that the mayors of our country are asking for an urban transit um, strategy. And uh, I think uh, we need to listen what they are proposing. It's an investment, it's true, but we'll save so much money elsewhere if we invest well in urban transit that uh, all this must be in a, within the capacity of the federal government. We cannot pour money everywhere and to come back to deficit, but I would be uh, very willing to make urban transit a, a large part of the infrastructure money that the federal government will invest in the coming years. According to the Canadian Federation of Municipalities, we have a deficit of $60 billion in investment in, uh, in infrastructure. Uh, I would like to focus our necessity to tackle it on urban transit especially. All right, thank you. Uh, we only have five minutes left in our meeting. We're going to very quickly try and go to two or three more questions. So lean in here. Let's have a really crisp question, please. Okay, so I wanted to ask you if you see contradiction in what you're saying, basically. In one sentence, you both and, uh, and Mr. Uh, Turner mention, uh, I mean, have the glee over the growth of Milton, which I think is an environmental disaster. And then, in the second part of the sentence, you say how environmental you are. Do you see the contradiction here? I know, I see the reality of life. Um, <laughs> You see, um, if people are not going in Milton, they will go elsewhere, and maybe they will pollute less or more, we don't know. So growth is part of life. There is no politician on earth able to be elected in saying, I want to kill the growth. Vote for me, no growth will come. It doesn't work. People want to become richer, they want to offer to their children the higher standard of living. What we need to, to work together, and this is more difficult than to kill the growth, is to have sustainable growth. Since the growth is unavoidable, unavoidable, the growth is unavoidable, inevitable, unavoidable, and we need to work together to make it sustainable. So the, these, these plans, these solutions, what we are talking about, is to have sustainable growth. I think the ones that are saying we need to, to stop the growth will have to figure out how 9 billion of human beings will live in 2050 without, without any growth. It's, it's not possible. Uh, I am not a one-issue uh, leader. I am a third-pillar leader. I want economic prosperity for Canada. I want social justice. That means I want more, more wealth, and I want to share it. That's why I am a liberal. And I want environmental sustainability. That means growth not only for us, but for our, for our children and the next generation. We need to combine the three. We cannot choose. We liberals, we don't choose. We want everything. We want economy, social, environment together. All right. We have run out of time. We're going to have one more question. You're it. Make a brief, please. Okay. Um, I'm a soft environmentalist, and uh, I like to save the environment except when it costs me too much. Um, what, uh, what plan do you have to try and embed uh, the environmental cost and prices to encourage me to make better choices? Yes, we need an environmental tax reform. It's why I just said the, uh, the GST tax cut of Mr. Harper was a big mistake. And I will not do the other one. 
I would prefer to invest uh, whether in environmental incentives to help you to make the link between your wallet and the planet to do the good choices. I would like also to invest for the most vulnerable of our society. Um, we have one million child, children in poverty in Canada and we would uh, increase the uh, child tax benefit to give to their parents $5,000 a year instead of 2000 as it is the case now. And we would put these kids out of poverty in Canada. It would be a good investment. I want to help you to retrofit your house, to pay less electricity bill. I think there are a lot of ways to decrease taxes, to improve the social justice in this country, and the environmental sustainability, and the competitiveness of our country. Because uh, other countries are not stopping to invest in research and development, commercialization, universities. Other countries are investing in their student, students, in their human capital. We should do the same in Canada. And the last budget uh, that Mr. Hopper uh, decided to have was wrong for our competitiveness, wrong for our social justice, and wrong for our environment. Let pray that, let's pray that the next budget will be good for the economy, the environment, and social justice. I give him a lot of suggestions. We'll see. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, um, Mr. Dion, we have a citizen here, Kevin Brackley, who has a little gift for you uh, about Halton. Monsieur Dion, ça c'est un livre de tout le Halton, comme ça, pour qu'il le fasse. When you're at 24 Sussex, uh, sit down and read it, and don't forget Halton when it comes to grants. Merci beaucoup. Merci mille fois. I will read it in stone away. It will help me to find the way for Sussex. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think on behalf of all of us, I'd like to uh, thank Stéphane Dion for an extraordinary hour. Uh, he's been here, of course, you've seen today, there's no holds barred. Uh, this is the kind of leader who listens to everybody. It's impressed me tremendously since joining his team. And I hope here today that you feel that you've gotten to know him a little better. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. I know it takes a lot to come and be here. Uh, we're all busy people. We tremendously enjoy it. And I want to thank you so much for being part of what has been a little exercise in democracy here in Halton. We've been honored to have you, sir. Thank you.